Uh, good evening. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is arthrogryposis. Uh, now, this is quite a rare disorder to be speaking about on a very regular basis, but uh, this was uh, asked by one of you uh, because uh, you had confusions regarding this particular topic. Now, arthrogryposis is uh, a spectrum of disorder. So it is not just one single uh, entity, but it is a spectrum of disorders. Basically, it has diminished fetal movements. Extremely sorry, that is a uh, not metal movements. That's a fetal movements, congenital joint stiffness, and varying degrees of muscle weakness. So it is a symptom complex, which which has varying degrees of these three particular symptoms. That is diminished movements, congenital joint stiffness and varying degrees of muscle weakness. Now, this symptom complex is a wide array of uh, different different uh, diagnoses. And to find out how this particular child or infant will do, we need to reach a definitive diagnosis. Because the definitive diagnosis gives us an idea about the prognosis and the inheritance patterns. And based on the prognosis and the inheritance patterns, we can do patient and parent counseling. This is important because there are three to four different types of arthrogryposis. The most common type of arthrogryposis is the classical arthrogryposis, which is known as amyoplasia. The second most common is the distal arthrogryposis. There are six to 10 different subtypes of distal arthrogryposis. It is important to note here that classical arthrogryposis, which is amyoplasia, is not inherited, is not genetically transmitted. Whereas distal arthrogryposis can have varying modes of inheritance. And they can vary from autosomal dominant to autosomal recessive to X-linked recessive. There are certain mitochondrial inheritances also seen along with arthrogryposis. Apart from that, there are other conditions that mimic arthrogryposis, such as Beal syndrome, which is contractural arachnoidectomy, where they have long fingers in contractures. There can be Freeman Sheldon syndrome, which is basically club feet with whistling face syndrome, and multiple pterygium disorder, that is the Escobar syndrome. So these are a few conditions which also mimic arthrogryposis because there is diminished joint movements and they can be inherited, that is genetically transmitted. Remember, classical arthrogryposis, amyoplasia, is not inherited. So if you are seeing a child with amyoplasia, you can counsel the parents that this is not going to be transmitted henceforth and it is a sporadic mutation. There is very less chance of having another child with amyoplasia which is equal to the chance of having amyoplasia in the regular uh, population. Now coming to distal arthrogryposis, I have already mentioned there are six to 10 different subtypes. Now that depends on which classification you use. A common classification which is used earlier was the Hall's classification, which has six different subtypes. Okay. Now if you see Hall's classification, which is a second column here, you have only two types type one, and type 2, which is subdivided into five types. So a total of six types are seen. Now do not go into the different, which uh, different subtype has which different category. Also do not look at the classification of Hall or classification of Bamshed. Please look into the di distinguishing features which are present here. Okay, so the distinguishing features which you will see here are important because these conditions can be overlapping uh, the non-orthopedic conditions. Okay, so uh, the distinguishing features which we see here in uh, type 1 are the overlapping fingers, neonatally and the ulnar deviation of the wrist. Okay, apart from this, in type 2, also, there is Freeman Sheldon syndrome. Now, the Freeman Sheldon syndrome, all of us know, is a club foot with a whistling face syndrome. Apart from this, there is cleft lips, cleft palates, 
short stature, scoliosis, ptosis, limited ocular mobility, uh, hearing disorders, which is both sensory neural. Uh, there can be trismus, uh, finger contractures, multiple pterygiums can be seen. There can be long fingers and there can be flexion contractures of the, uh, of the calcaneus as well. So these are all the different associated conditions that you are going to see with arthrogryposis. So in case you see, a, uh, you get an exam question and they're asking you clinical features. All of these are clinical features of arthrogryposis multiplex congenita. Now coming to arthrogryposis as such, it is a rare disorder with an incidence of one in 3000 live births. However, True amyoplasia, which is the classical form of arthrogryposis, is far less common, which is 1 in 10,000 live births. So if there is a child with true amyoplasia, you can tell the parents that this is not genetically transmitted and the chance of their next kid having true amyoplasia is 1 in 10,000 and no more than that. The condition arthrogryposis was first described back in 1841. However, the term arthrogryposis multiplex congenita came into use only in 1923, which is quite recent. Now coming to an overview, uh, it is important because uh, when we first see the child, uh, say in the neonatology uh, unit or in the pediatric uh, outpatient, pediatric or, uh, outpatient, the clinical picture picture that we see is quite bizarre. When we see the child, uh, it's the child is suffering from dramatic disabilities, and there are deformities, and the child is basically not moving much. It's, the mobility is quite restricted. Now, keeping this in mind, the parents will come to you with a lot of agony and would want you to perform one or other miracles. Now, it is important that the first miracle you perform is counseling. Okay, because this extensive counseling is needed because uh, in spite of these deformities and the disabilities that the child is uh, born with, they often uh, grow up to have a very functional life. Okay, so even with incomplete treatment or incomplete correction of all their deformities, these children can still lead a quiet functional life. So there are different uh, uh, awareness groups, there are uh, social support groups for uh, children with amyoplasia or with arthrogryposis. And you see that children, even though they, this is a toddler, say about say seven to eight years old, and the child is still is still has the features of arthrogryposis is walking with a, a knee ankle foot orthosis but is still able to functionally lead a life okay so that is uh, something that is very very important uh, we need to counsel them that not everything is bad and things will grow out to get better now coming to the causes of uh, uh, arthrogryposis multiplex congenita it can either be genetic like the distal arthrogryposis. It could be viral or a post-viral infection. Uh, Coxsackie virus is one of the virus. Newcastle virus is another virus which has been uh, postulated to be causing arthrogryposis multiplex congenita. But most of all, it is the post-viral autoimmune attack on the acetylcholine receptors, which is the neuromuscular receptors, uh, which is uh, postulated to be causing arthrogryposis. And lastly, vascular interruption, because uh, most of these associated conditions that you are seeing uh, are all associated with vascular interruptions. They can also have uh, gastroschisis, uh, they can have vascular abnormalities, uh, they can have tracheoesophageal fistula. So all of these uh, things, uh, intestinal uh, atresias, uh, Mobius sequence and uh, pollen sequence, all of these are vascular problems okay and if uh, arthrogryposis is seen along with these uh, conditions it is postulated that vascular interruption could also be a cause of uh, arthrogryposis so what do these uh, common things uh, what do these common causes do that is 
no matter if it's a genetic cause of a post viral cause or a vascular cause all of these lead to fetal akinesia and this fetal akinesia leads to the spectrum of clinical findings that is fibrosis of joints lack of creases along the joints thin atrophic extremities because the muscular mass is being replaced by fatty accumulations so there is a change of the muscles into fat apart from that there is fatty accumulation around the joints as well so these are all sausage shaped joints because the joints are a little thicker and they are both uh, thin proximally as well as distally because the muscle mass is very very meager now coming to the orthopedic manifestations in the upper extremities classically in classical arthrogryposis you see shoulders that are adducted and internally rotated elbows that are extended wrists that are flexed and annular deviated and an intrinsic plus hand so this is very common to the birth brachial plexus palsy or the urbs palsy where you see a a beta tip deformity that is the shoulders are adducted and internally rotated elbows are extended wrists are flexed and annular deviated and there is an intrinsic plus hand apart from this even the thumbs are adducted 